everybody! Welcome back to my channel and if you're new here, I am Mariana and I interview the brightest minds of physical therapy. So if you want to increase your knowledge, start right now by subscribing to this channel, clicking on the bell so you don't miss anything, give us a thumbs up and share with your friends. Today our guest is Dr. Andrew Margit and he's going to talk about the Schroth Method, an evidence-based specialized type of conservative management of scoliosis. Andrew is certified in the Schroth method and is diplomat in the McKinsey method. I hope you enjoy the show. Hi, Dr. Andrew. Welcome to PT Pro Talk. How are you today? I'm doing very well and uh, thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk about scoliosis today. So uh, before we talk about that, just tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, your career. How did you get to where you are right now? Yeah. So where I am right now is I'm uh, in Jacksonville, Florida. I'm the owner and physical therapist at Take Control Physical Therapy Centers, a certified McKenzie Clinic, um, as well as a Schroth Scoliosis Center in um, Northeast Florida. Um, how I got here was um, I graduated from a doctoral PT program in 2011 um, at the University of Scranton in Pennsylvania. I grew up my whole life in the Northeast of the United States. So um, I grew up in New York. I went to school in Pennsylvania. Um, I worked at a school in an outpatient setting. I've always worked in outpatient orthopedics. It was just something that was attracted, uh, was attracted to. And I worked with a couple different uh, certified McKenzie trained therapists. I got exposed to that at, um, at an early point in my career. Um, I did two different outpatient rotations through school. What, the first one was with um, someone that was a fellowship um, trained with the, the AOMT and as well as an OCS uh, therapist. So went there, tried to work with the best. And um, I think the therapist there was excellent, but the real difference, and I'm sure our listeners understand that the, you know, the, the mechanical diagnosis reliability um, that you can do for people that are trained, um, it really was immediately different for me. And seeing um, that the therapist work with patients and, and how fast they were able to get people better. It, um, immediately, I immediately knew I wanted to work with people like that. So, um, I became certified in mechanical diagnosis and therapy in 2014. Um, a year prior to that, I became certified in the Schroth method in 2013. I was one of the first, uh, 50 therapists certified in the United States at that time. Um, and certification, the Schroth method is, is what I do and treat for the scoliosis patients that are at risk of curvature progression, or um, um, I use the, those concepts for people that don't have one of the MDT syndromes. And um, so, so from that, that point, I was working in an outpatient uh, facility for five years and I met my wife. She is, uh, had training and she's a physician. So we went down to Augusta, Georgia. Um, I was there after five years of practice for four more years. That's when I decided to do the diploma program, mainly because I was now in a different setting and I no longer had other MDT therapists around me. And so it was important that I, I knew that I wanted to do that, but that was the time to do it because I was finding that my skills were maybe deteriorating a little bit, or I, I was the only MDT therapist in the room. So I didn't have someone to bounce ideas off for, or even communicate in the same language. So I went through the diploma program um, and graduated that um, and passed the exam in 2019 which then that's, that's, um, that brings me to um, Jacksonville just a couple of years later. I spent some time in Utah as well with my wife's fellowship. And, um, and then, you know, I, I eventually ended up here. Awesome. Long story, right? Yeah, no, that's awesome. And so let's talk about the Schroth method. So what is it? Yeah. So the Schroth method, it, you know, for me, it, it, it was something that really made sense to me because it, it's a classification system. So it's used to help identify um, patients that have risk of curve progression. Um, and curvature progression is typically measured by the degree of the curve from what we call the Cobb angle. A Cobb angle is the measurement from the end of the curve at one vertebrae to the end of the, the vertebrae on the, um, the opposite side. And a curve angle greater than 10 degrees is considered clinically diagnosed as structural scoliosis if it has rotation. 
Um, just getting the definitions out there before I go completely into what is the shrot. So that way the listeners are on the same page. This is different than someone that comes in with like a lateral shift or an acute scoliosis or a functional scoliosis deformity. These are patients that have structural changes in three dimensions. Um, and, and so the Schroth method was developed actually in the 1920s. So it's actually over a hundred years old and it was developed by a woman um, and then further developed by her children, one became an orthopedic surgeon, one was a physiotherapist, and they set up camps and to work on this method of taking different classifications of different curve types and putting them into three-dimensional corrections, almost similar to like Ray would do, and use these exercises to find a a change in the um, the posture and symmetry of the curvatures, and it's the only treatment right now that has been shown to have research supporting it um, at a randomized control trial level to reduce curvature progression um, risk. And, and so the method itself is looking at improving postural symmetry through conservative exercises and then done in a way so that you are creating independence. It's not a passive technique. Someone's not lying on the table and you're mobilizing them and manipulating there. Um, or, or it's just strengthening your core where your core is, is still promoting still the curvature. You're taking the abnormal um, symmetries of the, the thoracic and the scapular and you're bringing it to more symmetrical position, almost like an eclipse, right? Where we bring that together. You teach the patient how to do that in multiple different postures and positions. And as a result, you can have the effect that we just discussed. Awesome. So how do you, utilize the method for reducing the curve progression risk? Yeah, so so what a typical, I think the best way to answer that would be like what a typical examination would be like, uh, you know, and then go from there. So how we reduce the curvature progression risk is that we, we have a, a patient come in and these patients that could have, be at risk of progression, they can sometimes be adults or they can primarily be Adolescence, um, a majority of scoliosis still is idiopathic, meaning there's no specific um, known cause at this time. We think there's a genetic link. Um, a lot of times, a mother or a father that had it that, that's progressed um, or a high level curvature, they have a chance to, to pass it down, but there's still some information lacking with that. Um, so if I see an adult with scoliosis that's at risk progression or an adolescent, um, we'll do an examination where we're going to look at the blocks of the body, typically there's either like three curve patterns or four curve patterns or singular patterns. When we say curve patterns, we're thinking about like different blocks of the body. So we think about the hip and the pelvis, we think about the back, we think about the thoracic spine and the effect on the shoulder blades. Then what we do from there, looking at the curve pattern, we're then going to have the patient draw it to them or whatever, we're gonna ask them just, just like we would do with a mechanical exam, the patient's the expert on their symptoms and how they behave, and you need to get out of them how to educate them and, and how to teach them a program. So we would we would have the patient, we'd go through their curve classification, we'd show them where their deviations is. Are, do they have a pelvis that's out to the left or right? Do they have a lumbar curvature that's dominant that's causing them to put more weight on that dominant side? So example, a common curvature would be a curve to the right of your thoracic spine and a curvature to the left of your lumbar spine because the heart's on your left and tends to be that way. And typically the dominant curvature bears the weight. So if you have a curvature that's dominant on the left lumbar spine, it typically that concavity will cause that right hip to then move out and put your weight through your left. Once we draw this with different eye little blocks or boards and things like that, that I would do with the patient, we then talk about how to position themselves in a unloaded position without gravity, lying down in their stomach or their side or their back. And we are always monitoring pain for that. And we would use the MDT assessment to, to address if they, if they have pain from scoliosis or not. But what we're talking about is specifically how to reduce the curvature. And so we would then take them in a position that doesn't have gravity eliminated to them progressing to the more functional position, sitting, standing, taking their curvature and correcting it in 3D and correcting it that way. That's awesome. I'm, I'm curious to learn about what you said in independence. That's very similar to MDT. So um, you are pretty much like teaching movements, exercises, breathing. I read about the breathing techniques as well. Yes. So that's how 
kind of works. Yeah, you know, the challenge in this, as I'm saying this right now, in the first two amps, I realized my history is like really long, right? And then this is, you know, it, it's complex. And so, and so, you know, MDT can be complex too. We take complex medical presentations and then we explain it to someone in a very simplistic way. Well, that's what I would do here too as well. To explain to the listeners how we would correct a curvature, it would be just imagine you have Lego blocks or a sandwich and you have a burger, maybe onions, tomato, lettuce, you know, a patty. And then on each side, maybe on the right side, left side, the onions are sticking out or the, the patty sticking out or the cheese is out. I'm going to teach that person, depending on where their abnormal symmetry would be, how to get that burger to line up. And so once we teach them that, we teach them how to hold that by correcting breathing into that position because it usually affects the, the lungs in your body. So that's a, I think that's the more simplistic way to kind of look at it. We're taking different people with different curvatures, making symmetry, and then just like in a derangement or we would be reducing, then but when they're not in that position, they're maintaining it. We're teaching them how to sit and stand in a more symmetrical posture. Yeah. So it would be positions, movements, breathing, right? The, through this line. Yeah, and that would be your corrective exercise. So we're doing corrective exercises and we may use rolls underneath their, their body where the, their prominences are in their scoliosis. And we will allow them to be corrected in 3D. Then they're gonna to learn to hold that position. They're, go, they're going to learn to activate different muscles if they're isometric exercises that they're going to do. For example, let's say we have a left lumbar curvature. And so the curvature for that person, we're going to use the muscles on the right side of their hip, like the psoas, because that because the attachments attached to the spine, we can allow them to correct their pelvis so that they allow their spine to go straightened in a position. And then we may use an exercise where they're lifting up their lower resistance through their right hip flexors to then pull and activate and strengthen that position. That's the corrective exercise. Then the maintenance kind of part of it is they're being going from a habit posture, which is their scoliosis posture, to a conscious posture where they're creating symmetry. So they're going to learn both. And usually it takes someone about 10 to 12 sessions to get independent in that. That's right? very interesting. Yeah. No, it makes more sense. And what curves are at risk of progression even into adulthood? Yes, yeah, so good question. So going into what causes a curve to progress, there's something with scoliosis that we call the vicious cycle. So that is an unknown triggering event for most people that starts abnormal symmetry. And that abnormal symmetry then will start to cause a change in your structure, your curvature. That person then stays in that posture and position and they get growth spurts and grow and that gets into a big cycle and they just stay in that cycle. Treatment would be to stop that progression or get themselves out of that constant cycle state. It's important to just understand these kind of key concepts as we talk about scoliosis. So a curvature that is greater than 30 degrees on the Cobb angle even when they're done growing, statistically, that can still progress and that person should still be monitored. Progression in scoliosis is defined as more than five degrees of the curvature in any subsequent year. The reasoning for that is that five degrees is the measurement error. So because of, because of the way you could be standing could be a little bit off you know, from um, film to film of x-ray, as well as the equipment to be monitored. So any curvature that does not increase or decrease more than five degrees. So, for example, you have a 25 degree Cobb angle. Well, at that degree, if it's 27 next time you measurement or, or 21, that's kind of almost the same curvature we set. But anything more than five degrees would be a statistical change. All right. And yeah. Do you see a lot of uh, adults progressing these curves through the years? It's very common. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's, so that's, that's where we, so we talked just about almost like adolescent scoliosis. So then the adults, we said there's two types of adults that can have curvature progression. So an adult can have a curvature that was poorly managed when they're younger, but didn't maybe need surgery. And so maybe they have a curvature that's 35, 40 degrees, 
34 degrees. And then that person, because they're not going through their growth spurt, they have a slow progression over time. And then they get an x-ray and they realize, oh, you know, they start to they, they see a change in maybe their breathing, um, or they just, they, they're, they're monitored for it and they get it, they have back pain. They go get another x-ray and they go, oh, you had this large curvature, 40, 45, you know, degrees that maybe they initially were diagnosed and they only had uh, a measurement of 32. Again, with that measurement error, it could have been higher than that. Um, that's one type. The other part is degenerative scoliosis, where someone can have a curvature based on a osteoporotic change or postmenopausal change for women. So you can have changes due to like a lateral listhesis from osteoporotic fracture or compression fracture, um, or you can just have a restart of the curvature from bone weakening diseasing. Um, so both of those uh, could be at risk of progression, um, especially the person that maybe didn't have really scoliosis before and has a fracture, and now they have created this curvature that has this higher degree angle. Okay, yeah, I haven't thought about these aspects, but yeah, it makes perfect sense. And is this curve uh, progression linked to pain or not? Yeah, so curve progression is, and scoliosis actually itself is not linked to pain. So they did a great um, meta-analysis, systematic review of all risk factors. And I mean, they actually do this in the McKenzie MDT, I think part A course, they either talk about this, or it's definitely in Ron McKenzie's book, when they look at review on risk factors for back pain. I suggest anyone should go and look at that. And they looked at leg length discrepancy. They looked at scoliosis. There was no effect and, and, and causation there between causing low back pain higher than the normal population. As we all know, to be born on this earth is to probably get an episode of low back and neck pain. So what happens is a lot of these patients are confused how to manage this because there are many patients that have mechanical derangements that need directional specific exercises and treatment. There doesn't also mean there are, are, are patients that have other, right, the, the fourth syndrome that kind of scares us as MDT therapists because we, we get really good at the derangements and then, then it's like, you know, how, how do, what do we treat next? Well, there's also patients that are other and the other classification for scoliosis would be other structurally compromised. And so um, that's why it's such a great treatment option or I encourage colleagues to that haven't been exposed to MDT to go to a level where they're reliably using it, especially at the credentialed and diploma level, because that's how you can be able to differentiate the two. You know, you make sure the confidence of knowing I know how to rule out a derangement can allow us to not have confirmation bias to any one specific cause. So like somebody that goes into an examination and says, I'm looking for leg link discrepancy. I'm sure we've all had patients that said, oh yeah, my hips are off, right? Or, you know, yeah, but, but that's how that examination we know is not as reliable. So MD the exam, use that to differentiate the two different types, other structurally compromised and derangement syndrome or one of the other syndromes that are available. So how do you utilize the mechanical examination and treat derangements in scoliosis? So do you assess as MDT first, if they have pain, for example, changing a little bit the question, if they have yeah. pain, you're going to assess them through MDT. So make sure the pain is not coming for, uh, from a derangement and, and then you're going to treat the scoliosis. So how do you use the, the approaches? Yeah. So it's always by listening to the person in front of me. I know it sounds like a silly answer, but it's really important. If the person has two out of 10 shoulder blade symptoms and they're coming in because their curvature is at risk of progression, that needs to be the focus. So my focus will be on teaching them that because that's their goals and that's what's gonna be most self-limiting. We will go back and examine that, but that may be that focus. However, if the person is coming to see me for pain and discomfort in their shoulder blade or their butt or down their legs or uh, paresthesia or, or something like that, we're always gonna use the most reliable assessment, which is mechanical diagnosis and therapy. And, and what's really important is that allows me to not have confirmation bias, right? So we don't want it to be anything other than it is. So we do the exam the same way and we rule out MDT syndromes. 
that are drained and postural and um, and dysfunction. Okay, and then if you have others, so yeah, then what interventions interventions do you use? What do you do? Yeah, so if we did come across that, um, and that that isn't as high, you know. So so in my clinical experience, I would say that I I would. And I've, I probably have treated scoliosis as probably 30% to 40% of my patient practice um, for since, since being certified. You know, it, it's been a big portion of it. Um, people seek me out for the, the Shroth assessment. Um, but what I would say is probably the same values. You know, um, 70, 80% of acute and subacute pain is going to be derangement. Chronic symptoms that are lasting longer than 12 weeks, about 50, 60% derangement. Um, and then I would say other is mainly primarily in the population that's for structural scoliosis that is probably over the age of like 60, 65. And those patients have a history that is very consistent, right? So no variability, no obstruction from sitting or flexion, right? And they're gonna be worse with weight-bearing activities like walking and standing because that's when they're being more compressive. Similar to like we would think with someone that truly has a structurally compromised other classification. That's what I've seen too, consistency as well as worse with loading, yeah. Okay, so it may be a dumb question. So others. Oh, yeah, never, yeah. <laughs> so what is the difference between the scoliosis that you treat for reduce the curve and the other from McKenzie? Would you use like the same approach or? Yeah, so I think that's a great it? question. And, and I hope everyone's following, following along. If you're not sure of something, I'll be giving my email out at the end so you can ask. But but the the what we're asking and we're talking about here is so we've done the examination, right? We get through the history of that and we have our, our funnel and then we have derangement or other, we got to other, all right? So we took one to three sessions. You know, Ron McKenzie said you could even go up to four or five sessions get the classification confirmed. We want really in the one first one through three. And then we got other. And so those patients that don't have any rapid change from any specific movements or postures, I will then put them in positions in an unloaded position that assists them to then create pressure off of their spine in a more symmetrical position. Similar to how someone with other knee osteoarthritis, when we do the MD exam, what would be evidence-based practice for that? I think Rich, uh, uh, Rosedale did a great study on uh, osteoarthritis in the knee and he took people that had directional specific exercises and he did people that had evidence-based treatment and then a ruled out derangement and the people that didn't um, that, that didn't have derangement, they still did better with, with exercise. So the idea is the same. We're trying to support the structure. Now, some of these people are usually much more, um, what I found, their, their posture, these are curvatures that are people that, that are now it's a danger for them to have surgery. So these are, these are really high level adults, osteoporosis, a fusion in their back, it would be risky at this point. And so we're looking for any ability to decrease aggravating factors. So similar to like uh, maybe a stage of severe stenosis that, that you're looking for you know, conservative treatment that's not a soft tissue stenosis, we're stretching and remodeling. So we would put, let's say, we're, let's use an example so somebody can listening can understand. So let's say we have a curvature on the left side of my lower back and the right side of my thoracic spine. That's our common curvature. And physically, when they lie down on their side or, or on, their, on their back or their side, it, it's they can't actively move. It hurts them too much. Because that, that's actually commonly what I see with these patients. They're, it's very irritable. They like to just stay still, especially in sitting um, or lying down, but their symptoms can start to turn off on compression. So what we would do is, similar to how I would teach someone back at, at teaching the exercise, people don't know how to move. So we almost like a training wheel, we put rice bags or hand towels underneath their prominences. So for a left dominant curvature, we would put it underneath their left lumbar spine, one at their right shoulder blade, and actually one up by their 
the tip of their left shoulder to opposite effect because normally a right curvature on the thoracic spine is going to cause their right shoulder blade to come forward and the left to be retracted. So we're going to do the opposite. So that way, that's why that's important. That now gives room. Now the shoulder blades are, are changed to now slide the spine and push it into a more symmetrical posture. And we usually would tell them to be then sustained in that position. Eventually, if that gives them relief, we can start trying to do it actively by teaching them basically taking the rolls out and then having them hold those positions. But um, it, it's really about giving them relief in a, some sort of posture, but you're not going to see them stand up and now their side glides better, right? Now they're bending back better. If I see that, then I would go, I missed the derangement, you know, right? You know, and then, then look at it that way. But basically I'm teaching it in a similar way, but, but these patients that are other classification than pain, um, we're being very gentle and we're, we're being a little more sustained postures and positions um, to, to give them relief um, from the compression. So you are using more the Schroth method mm -hmm. to kind of um, give support to their structures that are compromised. Yeah, to create symmetry. Yeah. Opening, yeah, because yeah. their problem, yeah. their, their pain would be generated from compression at that point. Um, so yeah, that, that's a that, you know, if you think of a Venn diagram, why someone see me, it would be pain in one circle, posture in one circle, progression in one circle. Mm -hmm. Most people have the combo, right? So pain and posture, posture and progression, posture, progression, and pain. So it, it's not like they're usually only in one. And so that's what's great about with these patients and scoliosis, you need to use a classification system. We're not learning that now. Not everybody's the same, not their beliefs are not the same, you know, about how they feel scoliosis, what they've been educated about their imaging. Um, and some of them, most of them don't even know their risk of progression or what that would be. So they just know their curve is progressing. So it's important to have a frank conversation and measure what's more important here, the pain and risk of that progressing, um, it, so you look at, are they improving, unchanging, worse? All the stuff we learn in, in, in being a strong therapist, especially in the MDT background. And then if they're worsening, what's causing them worse? Are they worsening because they they can't breathe or they can't stand from tolerance, not because of pain, but they actually can't physically stand because of compression? Or is it because of um, something that's just purely mechanical and they have good days and bad days, you know? Okay. Yeah. No, it looks like the, the, the MGT fits very well with the, the techniques so you can approach the pain and and exclude the arrangements and treat the, the, the progression, the curve progression. So uh, it's very interesting. And question, can you do this virtual or you do just in person? Yeah. So, so that, that's a, so for me, I, I do treat a lot of virtual patients um, because I have, as I said, I had a long journey in the history. We have viewers still hanging in there that after that long history, it, it was, you know, I, I was, I have a license in Utah. I have a license in South Carolina, Georgia, New, New Jersey, New York, and Florida. So I will typically do the examination because if it's a derangement, I want to, I can be able to do that through telehealth. I think that's really strong there. The, I have, I like to try attempt if I'm the only one in the area to, to, to review and, and do um, an evaluation, but sometimes for some of the sh with the Schroth patients, if they need to only be taught the corrections, if it's an adult, they have more difficulty. I actually found that children can can be it can be utilized that way because what happens is with the technology, with the pandemic, has now allowed us to have different technology and resources. I had patients that I couldn't have that start started Schroth, and then you know might have three months, four months without coming in. So what we did was we the telehealth option I adapted. I think, and that's what a great therapist does, it adapts. And so we were, we take a picture of them in different positions. And now with, with Apple, you can actually draw and edit arrows to show where they need to move their curvature of their spine. Um, and, and so it can be, it can be done um, clinically that way. It just depends on the patient. But especially if someone has already done an evaluation with me, somebody comes in and sees me in person, once we have the initial session, I can be able to help them from that. You know, it, it depends on the type of learner someone is. Yeah, I was just wondering because probably there are not many therapists certified on the method. So just if even for us, like I see some patients, uh, it's just good to know uh, that we have someone that specializes on just treating scoliosis. So that's awesome.
Yeah. And so what I would reference with that is two things. There, there is a website, just like we have a McKenzie listing website. So you can, there's two different forms of certification currently in the U S there was the BSPTS, which is something that is more and more expanded throughout the U.S. on on Schroth certification. And then there was also Schroth certification done through the German clinic. Um, So actually from Germany, when there wasn't as much BSPTS offerings available, um, I got certified through the the German clinic when they offered it in in New York City. And and so I like that I have a little bit. I worked with the other therapists that way. But you can, if you Google Schroth therapist U.S. listing, you'll find therapists in your area. Um, and, and it's important if you're listening, go, well, I don't, you know, I don't always treat Schroth or I don't know if I understand this, this part of it. What you're looking for is just to have a better conversation with somebody. If somebody has scoliosis and they are not, and you're visually seeing when they bend forward for your normal testing, you see a huge rib hump or prominence on their spine. And if they say, oh, have you ever been diagnosed with scoliosis and they have no idea, you should get an x-ray. That's, you know, to, to understand, not for, for the, the diagnosis for their pain, but to understand, you know, if their curvature is 30 degrees or 35 degrees, like we're saying, that person in a year should do another x-ray just to see if that's actively progressing or not. We need to get to them so that I'm saying, I'm seeing people at a stage where they're really structurally compromised. We want to stop that. There's interventions now. Um, and, and so, if you're a therapist that treats an outpatient orthopedics, we should really be screening that better. Um, most of these things were missed when the people were in their 20s and 30s. So um, the hour Adam Forward's bend test, for people that maybe don't even know what that is, that's someone standing forward, bending forward, um, and then you're looking to see if there's a rotation effect. The rotation effect is the most structural change in scoliosis, more than the S or C shape. And they even have, I have an app, you can even that you download and called scoliometer, and you can literally put it on someone's back, and it can measure um, that rotation curve. And I know we're doing this here, but it's, uh, people can see on the YouTube thing. Yeah, yeah. So that, literally you can put this on. So it's really That's accessible. awesome. Yeah, and, and, and so you're looking for rotation, you know, with that. So, so I think again, um, it's really meaningful to have those conversations um, and differentiating. It's not just all about pain. We're also, you know, we're here to screen other things too as well. Yeah, yeah. And for the therapists that are curious about the cars, how long does it take? Yeah, so the courses have changed a little bit. Um, they, they originally had like a C1, 2, kind of part A, B. Now they've done part A, B, C, so they're expanding on it. Um, the course itself would probably take someone, you have, you basically, you need time treating patients and they, it, it's a, it's great because they have real patients come in just kind of like MBT get just really fit in. And, um, you, you go through the series of course, it typically would take somewhere between two and five years to complete. Okay. Yeah. 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 And, and it's, it's definitely something that's growing. I know we have a question coming up and don't want to spoil the surprise, but about research and, and, and we'll talk about some studies that support this. It, it's not dogma or, expert opinion. There's RCTs that support that this um, method can actually reduce curvature progression um, and symmetry and quality of life and body image for these patients, you know, especially a a, a female um, that is, you know, 10, 12, 13 years old. The first thing I always tell anybody is that I'm going to talk about your body, but this doesn't mean that there's nothing, there's like this thing wrong with your body or it's abnormal. Listen, I, I, as I said, I have 30, 40% of patients with scoliosis. Too many people don't even know they have it. The incidence rate of scoliosis actually increases every decade of life for a female because of the, we said the postmenopausal changes, as well as curvatures were not statistically picked up early on in life. Um, so, so I think um, knowing resources, like we said, and, and um, you, you know, if, if there's people that are interested in wanting to know more about the certification process, um, yeah, I'd be happy to talk to them more about that or, or direct them to that. I think the Institute, just like the Institute from the Kent Institute it, is strong. Um, and, and it, it really can be for me, it's, it can be very, very rewarding. I know I, I shared with you, um, prior to this podcast, some pictures. I mean, we, we, if you go to my website, you can see, we have pictures of patients that have curvatures 38, you know, 40 degrees and with bracing, they're able to reduce their curvature not just keep it the same, but reduce it significantly, 10, 15, 20 degrees, even some down to five and five and 10 degrees of their diagnosis. 
However, not everyone can do that. And, and so what, what we look at a shroth, it's not meant to be, I'm on this island, and then now you, this is like no one else can, can treat scoliosis. The best thing is a team. And so we look at here in Jackson, we have Nemours Children's Hospital, and we have an we look for orthotists. Is it different? The old brace would be a Boston brace. So that was a brace that only corrected it in one dimension. Now they have a new brace called the Rigo Chanel brace or the Wood Chanel Rigo brace, WCR brace. And that brace is designed to correct more of a rotation effect. And as a result, it's more effective. Just like core strengthening isn't that effective in curve correction because you're not changing the curve. So this condition and this diagnosis can have a complex psychological effect on patients. They feel like a whirlwind. So it's always a team approach. And for people that have, yeah, I think I know my doctoral program, no, don't know about you. I didn't really get a lot about scoliosis or shrot, you know, right? So, so it's one of those things where someone listening to this, this is to get you exposed on something that really has evidence on it. Um, you can learn more about it. I think like like um, you said, you looked at some things about it the, the, and, and I can reference some stuff later on this podcast, but, but you know, it, it's something that is very close to me and, and my heart and, and very rewarding to wake up every day and, and see changes um, and, and doing something that can help somebody um, uh, about their body image and the quality of life and, and surgery can be un necessary if we're doing the right thing, but it can be necessary for the right person to as well. Even if they do everything right, they may still need that, but at least they know they've done something. They didn't just wait and see. Yeah. And you just mentioned about the braces. So mo most of your patients, do they use braces to help on the treatment? Yeah. So yeah, they wanted to yeah. talk about that. So, so basically let's, let's, I'm going to go back and just talk about like risk of progression because there's some data on that. So okay. basically, just so everybody's on the same page, let's say I take an example of a of a 10-year-old and they have a curvature less than 20 degrees on their cob angle. Well, that person statistically between 10 and 12 years old has a 25% chance of that progressing. If that curvature stays the same when they're 13 through 15, they have a 10% chance. If that curvature stays the same at over age over 16 and skeletal maturity, less than 5% chance of progressing, very minimal, okay? So now let's take that curvature. Now we have 20 to 30 degrees. Well, if someone's diagnosed with a 20 or 30 degree curvature and they're 10 to 12 years old, that curvature has a risk of progressing by 60%. So remember, we just said that it's 25% for the less than 20. Then when they're 13 and 15, 40%, and then over age of 16, 10%. So at the 20, 25 degree mark, it is essential that that person starts shroth and gets the proper brace. Proper brace, the recommendation is the Rigo Chanel brace. You know, that brace is, is extremely, as is also supported by literature. So we want to do the combination. It's less than 20 degrees. Someone can initiate shroth, but, but, but it's, 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 it's also important to identify that we're not trying to say, you know, People sometimes will come to me, patients will be like, I'm doing this to try to not do the brace, or I'm doing this to try to, you know, you know, I, I'll, I never would do surgery. Well, this is a little different than when we're dealing with like a microdisectomy and the outcomes. If a, somebody has a curvature like 60 or 70 degrees, they don't have a surgery for that. And they decide to just keep waiting, waiting that off, even if they did all the things they needed to do at an earlier stage, it's dangerous. We're doing surgery for these patients because the the quality of life will decrease because their curve, curve is so progressing. It's progressing with time, even when they're done growing. So it, it's, it's something that we're looking to reduce and put them in the best possible situations that we can. And so they, they don't get fearful and disappointed when they go back for the x-ray every six months for their numbers. But, um, but bracing is a very vital vital step. It was so important. There was actually a research study. They looked at wait and see control groups and bracing. And then what they did was they looked and saw that they had to actually ethically stop the study because the bracing group was so much more progressing in these curvatures that were greater than 25, 30 degrees than the group that was the control with the brace. So, so that there was some controversy up to that time. Still, there were, there were some that said, oh, no, it's, it doesn't matter what you do. It can still progress because some people just don't progress. We, we haven't been able to figure that out. They've been doing blood testing and things like that and, and genetic history. But, but, it, but it's important that bracing is the standard. Then with bracing, it's shroth. 
Yeah, and that has the best evidence. And to kind of go into our, our research point here, is that there's they did a similar study. They did a wait and see group, and they did wait and see group with bracing, and they did a, they did a group with bracing and shroff. And this study was done, and I'm gonna I can reference it so somebody if that's listening can kind of look at it. This study was done in 2017 by um, the author was Kwan K W A N et al. And this was titled Effectiveness of Shroff Exercises During Bracing in Adolescent Idiopathic Scoliosis. So this was a randomized controlled trial. And so the results were for the control group um, versus the, the intervention group. The intervention group had a 40% chance of reduction of the curvature or keeping it there than the control group. And then we saw improvements in the rotation of the trunk, the cob angle, and the patient's actual quality of life because they were doing something. The person that's just sitting there with the brace they're also not having that team support that's saying that you need to wear this and, and, and you can do something else actively about it. Most of my patients that come to see me, they want to, their parents are very involved and they want to do more. So it's, it's, it's really, um, this was a groundbreaking study because it was the first randomized control trial at the time to, to show that. Now in, in 2020, there was a meta-analysis and there's a multiple RCTs that are now supporting it. You know, so, so, so it's something that takes a while because it takes, we're talking about monitoring someone from their age 10 to skeletal maturity, right? So, so these studies are more difficult to pattern. It may take 10, 15 yeah. years for the systematic review because what does a conclusion of systematic review will say? Well, we need more high quality studies, right? We need more. So if you only have two or three RCTs, that, you know, just like with MDT, they, they, they kind of get away with this. They try to do this too as well. And there's a big difference on evidence for lack of effectiveness versus lack of evidence for effective, effectiveness. Yep. Those are two different things, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and so we, I, you know, as, as this has been a lot about scoliosis, but I always have my MDT training and background, <laughs> you know, because to, to a little diploma program plug, that's a part of the training, critically analyzing literature and research. And, and so, so we, you can then take a different research that's not maybe pertaining to MDT and analyze it effectively. Um, it's important not just to read, um, Abstract, you need to look at authors' discussions and how they come to their conclusions, their inclusion criteria, right? You know, all these type of things. Um, and, and as a result, the, my, my analysis is that, that this is just going to continue to grow because there is no RCT that doesn't support it right now, which is, is great. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's even good to like normal therapies that deal with like orthopedic issues, but um don't know much about scoliosis because that's not something that we are very exposed to. Um, sure. And it's just great to know. I already thought a lot about uh, different patients that I had. I was like, okay, I can tell them, show like send this episode and, and see if there is therapies here in my area uh, to recommend or even do virtual, but that's all a lot of good information. Um, and just a quick question about the treatment. So you said that is average 10 to 12 visits. Do you pass it out? Like, or you just like teach them and then you follow up after a while to make sure they are doing well? How does it work? Or you do like all at once, teach them all the strategies and then they leave. So how it works. Yeah, so the ideal environment, it's basically I need about 10 to 12 hours with somebody. People have different um, body awareness, you know, kinesthetic awareness and different body position sense, you know, better than others. Um, you know, the, the, the adult patient has more maybe motivation and focus, and, but they have maybe sometimes worse mobility and the ability to correct um, their curvature. And, and, and whereas the, the nine-year-old, 10-year-old, um, may have a lot of distractions during the session. So, so, so they have more mobility, but maybe they don't have as much motivation and focus sometimes. You know, they, it's a lot. I don't want to wear the brace. Maybe I don't want to do the extra. So I have to meet somebody where they are um, with that. And so that's why it's that range. Ideal environment, where we, I would tell the person, we're not looking to see a change in this in two visits or two or three weeks. We're looking long-term as they grow. One of the measurements we use to know if it's necessary or not would be there's something called the RISER sign, R-I-S-S-E-R. -S -S -E and then that tells us their growth plate. So it's graded from a zero to five scale, five being they're done growing. And that combined with if somebody is um, 
you know, pre their first menstruation. And, you know, that that's when we know that they're going to be more at risk of progression because sometimes it can be somebody could be a, a 12 year old, but they're actually a skeleton mature, like a 10 year old, you know, just differences in people, the way they grow. Um, and, and so the ideal environment to back up your question is that I would like it over the course of like two or three months where we're doing like maybe two, two a week initially, and then once a week, and then we're following up until they get independence. The process not having always Schroth therapists in different areas um, has made it more difficult in that, that some people sometimes will fly in and then we do a week intensive. But, mm-hmm. but that can be useful. We, 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 we can do it. It's, it, it can be useful because now what I've learned is the advent of the telehealth, like I said, is that I actually, every patient I see, I like request that the final visit be telehealth because now I get to see what they do in their home environment. Yeah, absolutely. Okay? And, and their home environment is really important because then maybe, you know, we think we see something done this way and then we go home and like, oh, wait, they're not really doing it the way I thought we were because it's a different environment, different setup because these are truly our strengthening and body awareness exercises and the where you do it makes a difference. Yeah, the same thing with virtual PT because sometimes in the clinic, you recommend something and they get home, their chair is different, their couch is different, the, the place that they exercise is not the same. So it, it it's very useful and helpful. I found with my patients to be on their environment. So then they're like, okay, here is the little place that I do my exercise. So I'll, I'm be more likely to do it. And I know that it's going to work because I already had someone watching me and doing it. So um, I think it's, it's beneficial. Sure. Agreed. Well said. And okay. Before we transition to our final questions, do you have anything else to add? Um, about the the method or anything? Yeah, I think um, someone that's interested in learning more about it, I've done a couple webinars that are on YouTube. Um, I could recommend that I think it, it, I'm trying to, in, you know, without over talking, which is something that MDT, we try not to, we, less is more, right? We try to explain things simply, but it, it's complex, you know, right? Yeah. So, so to, to, to talk to therapists about it. To a patient, it's simple. It, this is what your curve is. You know, right. So, so I think that I, it's like about 35 minutes, but, but it's, it goes slower. It breaks it down. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's a good way to get resources about it. Um, my website explains a little bit more. The, the big takeaways I would say with this is that if you're MDT trained, you should still be using your, that hat, you know, for pain. If you have a scoliosis patient and their curvature is large, not at 10, 15, but something over 30 degrees, and they're an adult, they should monitor that, especially postmenopausal or they're, they're, um, they, they have osteoporosis, uh, you know, that, that could be at risk of progression. And then they should be monitoring that by measuring an x-ray a year because, and you're gonna say, you know, we're not looking at it going from one or two degrees, we're looking for five degrees. And there, there should be good physicians in the area that help you with that. You know, and you want to look for that. You want to look for the team. So um, big takeaways is, is you're, no one's going to be able to learn a method that took two or five years, right? You know, to yeah. learn. So we say, yeah. can someone in MDT part A, are they the same as someone that is certified or, or certainly at a diploma level? Same kind of thing, right? It, it, it's, it, people ask all the time, why would you go on the diploma program to just learn, just give out backbends? You already do that. The difference is, and I would always say this, that we, I went on the diploma program to know who to bend back and how to do it, right? Who should and shouldn't do it. It's not just given out because it's a treatment. Same thing with this. It's an assessment process, which makes it complicated, but the application should be done with the patient's beliefs taken into account, taking into the research, and then done in a simplistic way. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, resources of information that you would recommend. So you mentioned your webinar, you are at, already mentioned a couple of like papers. Um, yeah, the, the Quanit all one in 2017 is, is good. Effectiveness of Schrott exercises during bracing in adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Um, I have another one. I think it's good. Park et al. Effects of Schrott exercise on idiopathic scoliosis. The meta-analysis that was in the European Journal of Physical Re- Rehab Medicine. Um, June 2018. Um, those are my Schroth resources because because that that's what really makes a difference here. So 
sometimes there are patients that come to me and they they have you know just like in PT unfortunately there the, and there's there's bad in every profession right and I'm not I'm not really bashing any profession I'm bashing individual things and this kind of goes into um, a philosophy I think that many of our listeners can have is that sometimes people go to see somebody and because they have a diagnosis like this they could actually leave with more fear you know, that oh this is bad you, you know using words like that or you know you, you know I haven't seen scoliosis like this before or something like that. you know really really not we you know the words really matter and really you know leaving someone with a list of problems that they didn't even come in with you know right all these things wrong with them but that's normal for scoliosis you know the uh you know i think oh gosh i got I lost track i'm so sorry uh <laughs> But that, that would be my next question about what advice would you give to clinicians that are starting their careers? Yes, yes, sorry, yes. Yeah. So, so what, what advice I would give with clinicians starting their careers is a couple things. Whatever you do, and I'm, I'm taking this from people that are mentors of myself, um, don't be the, the smartest person in the room or feel like you're the smartest person in the room. Be in a room where you you're getting information like a sponge from people and people that are good at what they do and they specialize in what they do. Um, I don't know if you can do everything like a buffet. You can't kind of just throw things at the wall and hope things work. You should focus on assessment. Um, and that's like my, my number one advice. And, and I think that if you dive into MDT, I am a proponent that you know, the certification for many people, it's just not enough, especially if you're by yourself and you're not having access to um, colleagues that are pushing you and, and you're really reviewing cases. Get in a study group, that that's important. I'm in a diploma study group and I still do that even at th that level. The conferences, I know they haven't had them now for people that maybe it's gone maybe a decade since they've gone to a conference that 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 outside of the part A and B courses that they, they've done the C and D. Um, or the advanced extremity courses, the comments are really good because they update us. They update us on the relevant literature, changes, and you get to see people treat um, patients and you get to network. I think networking with mentors, find somebody. If someone doesn't have a mentor, they can reach out to me. I'd be happy to help anybody. A lot of people help me along the way. So, so that would be that. And then I would say work every day at communication. Um, I think the diploma experience that I had was very much, it's an internal experience. That's why it's different for each person. Um, people come in at different levels of skills in MDT, and it's really, they meet you where you are and push you to go further and internally tell you that you have what you need, but this is how to get there. Kind of like we do with patients. We don't look at a patient that comes in with low back pain and sciatic and go like, oh, I, they need me to lie on this table. They need me for me to get rid of their sciatic. They need to lie on this table for this manipulation, or they need me for this um, dry needling, or you know, this kind of stuff, these passive type of techniques. It, it, the process is that most likely, if you're listening to this kind of podcast, you're you're in that like 95th percentile of PTs. You want, you're not the nine to five PT that just wants to go home and, and you want to get more of it. So um, I, I would say it is important to focus on your communication mentoring and then putting yourself in a position where you're uncomfortable and you're looking in at your communication it, it, it's so important to explain things to patients in a simple way um and it's so important to then be able to take someone that might be really frustrated have a lot of different barriers and then explain to them that something maybe simple is how you'll get rid of it reduce their fear yeah sure that, yeah. that's a big part and then being aware um, there was another really good research article that it was called, um, it was, I think it was in Journal of Manual Therapy in 2012. It was called Thinking Beyond Muscles um, uh, and Therapists, Patients and Attitudes Beliefs Regarding Chronic Muscular Pain. It was done by, um, the author was Nij, N-I-J-S, um, et al. And it, it talked about how actually like physical therapists' beliefs and their their biases that they, some people don't even realize they have. They don't understand that maybe they like derangement syndrome or they like giving extension first and it's not really actually the best clinical reasoning or they like um, doing a certain type of treatment, you know, or they like a certain analogy. Those kind of things, you really want to kind of meet someone where they are. And um, that was a pretty good article and a pretty good lesson I went through is just saying, 
you know, I used to have all these analogies and I remember listening to podcasts and think, oh, I'm going to be real I'm a diploma program. I'm going to be, I'm going to impress them with my, my different analogies. that I've heard other diploma men mentors have said, and then it came <laughs> through and it was like, okay, all you had to do was say, you know, does this make sense to you? And then move on versus they didn't need an extra analogy, but then somebody else does need something. So I think not going in wanting to do treatment, wanting it to be a certain syndrome, wanting it to be a certain classification, wanting to give them even, you know, we, we bashed treatment, but what about wanting to give a certain type of education? Why not give the education of the person in front of you that, that just listen to them, see what they need, see how they explain things. Um, not everybody understands the DIS model and some people can get fearful from it. So, so what we have to do, you can know that in, in, if they say, oh, I, you know, I'm scared in the history on my herniated disc. And then you show them a model that shows them bend forward and a little bulge pops out uh, and, and they go, and then some people go like, oh my gosh, that's what happens when I bend forward. That's that I've seen, I've done been a mentor for students and I, I've seen them do that and they don't pick up. That's not good. They're saying they're getting fear from bending now, you know, that and you're going to have to reverse that. So you, what you do is you, you go, you, you should know then, Hey, I need to do a different intervention. Sometimes we are so good at, the mechanical thinking people get and, and not being critical of actually our educational interventions. If we're actually doing a good job with that, because we get so used to like a simple analogy. Um, but sometimes it doesn't work for everybody and you have to adapt. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's hard to find the right way to communicate with patients and, and read each different patient and their needs. So I think that's a big challenge for us as therapists that we have to progress. Um, final question, what personal qualities and abilities that you think are important to become a successful PT? Yeah, I, I think most importantly is being humble and your drive. And, and I think if you're humble and you, you, you kind of identify that we all went to school and we spent a lot of money, but maybe we actually aren't specialists and we shouldn't think we're specialists and, and, we, you know, that, that's, that's, that's important. And, um, you know, one note that I would say that anytime I'm talking to somebody, um, they, they want to know, you know, what's the difference in the diploma and the certified therapist or general therapist. It's the person that explains things well. And I, I mean it by this, and, and I'll use an example, because I just want to make sure I'm being very specific. There is not a patient that I see that after we do the history that I won't explain to them what we're going to do next. And I explain it in a way that allows me to then be neutral in the classification. And this is what I mean by that. Somebody comes in, we do the history, and I have my head, maybe some differential diagnosis, down to two, hopefully. And then I'll say to them, we're only going to give you one intervention or one exercise today for very specific reasons. One to make sure it's convenient for you. And two, and the most important reason that if you come back in and you feel worse on that day or the same, we won't know what did that if you did six or seven different things. And you need that to make sense of them that. And if it doesn't make sense, you can't move on because they have to understand they're active in this. And you have to explain to them before, I've seen people then start ex explaining derangement models before they even did the exam. We don't even know if they have a derangement yet. And so what happens is then they get to the end and they didn't find directional preference. And now they're in trouble because now they explain all this. If it's amazing to your own back book with centralization, they explained all these things, but they were biased from the beginning. It's important the patient has to accept what you're doing with them so that at the end, if you go, you can say a frank conversation. There are people that are drangers that based on fear or, 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 or just going slower, then they may not have a slam dunk response in issue or they may not have a derangement. But what you did is you set yourself up to say, okay, listen, we only have 30, 45 minutes here of, of movements. We're going to go home and send you home with something for 20 for 48 hours, but we're going to use it to test it. Then they go, remember, they remember, oh, earlier I made, he made a big point of saying that we're going to do one thing at a time. And you're doing that to learn and understand. That's what makes us different. I think and probably the listener are different. We're looking to understand if we just try to treat, that's where, that's the biggest, that's the mistakes come in. Yeah. And then somebody comes in worse and they go, 
they don't listen. You know, we make these quick adjustments and the clinical reasoning is so important. Yep. So I think being humble and being able to do um, good communication, good clinical reasoning is the key advice I would get. Awesome. Yeah. Um, now, after all these advice and everything you just uh, taught us, that was wonderful. Uh, if people want to learn more about you or if they want to contact you, ask questions, how they can uh, reach out. Yeah, sure. So a um, couple of things. If someone is local to my clinic in Jacksonville, Florida, um, and wants to see me, I think, you know, COVID's a little, it's tough, but but I think we're starting to get a point where if, if, if somebody, you know, wants to reach out and wants to um, observe I, or, or even just come in and, and talk and, and meet me that way. Um, people learn that way. They can come in. Um, you can find me at my website is www.takecontrolphysicaltherapy.com. Um, if you'd like to email me, my email is at info at takecontrolphysicaltherapy.com or andrew at takecontrolpt.com. And I'm on Instagram, Facebook as Take Control Physical Therapy. Um, and I'd be happy because so many people help me out. Most of the things that I said today, you know, they come from my collective experience, but I, but I stole a lot of these, you know, I stole them from mentors and, 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 and a lot of these things um, were based off of um, training and, and people that gave me a lot of time outside their working hours. So it, I'd be happy to pay that forward. That's awesome. We appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much, Andrew, for taking the time to share your passion. We can tell you're very passionate about your, what <laughs> you do and uh, that you love helping people and helping other PTs also to be exposed to different things and learn and improve. So uh, I really appreciate it. No problem. Thank you for having me.